Vel welcome to, to this uh, fifth episode of our webinar series, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, organized by the Center for Religious Studies of Fondazione Bruno Kessler and the uh, Center for Information and Communication Technology of Fondazione Bruno Kessler, in, which is based in uh, Trent, Italy, Northern Italy. Um, today's speaker is uh, Professor Inken Prohl from uh, the University of Heidelberg, my colleague Margherita Galassini, um, who will be chairing this, uh, this webinar, will introduce her. Let me just uh, uh, remind you that we will record this webinar, so if you do not want to be recorded, please make sure to switch off your webcams and microphones. Um, but I would like to ask you to do this anyway, at least for as long as uh, Inken is presenting. Um, so please switch on your webcams and your microphones only during the discussion when you want to ask a question. Um, yeah, without further ado, I pass the floor to uh, Margarita. Thank you very much for being here. I'm looking forward to, uh, to this webinar. Margarita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Boris. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to, to be chairing today's, um, today's webinar and to welcome our, our speaker, Inken, Inken Pro. Um, she's professor of religious studies at Heidelberg University. She's been conducting fieldwork in Japan and Germany for several years. Her research interests focus on modern transformations of Buddhism, on approaches of material religion, as well as on religion and artificial intelligence. Inken is currently working on new approaches in the field of Buddhism and consumption in cooperation with the project Buddhism, Business and Believers. Together with John Nelson, she published the Handbook of Contemporary Japanese Religions. Um, among her other publications, um, I'm going to mention Religious Innovations, the Shinto organization World Made in Japan, um, Zen for Dummies. I apologize, I translated these two last titles in English because I just can't speak German uh, nor pronounce it. Um, finally, I'm going to mention uh, California Zen, Buddhist Spirituality Made in America, um, an article which appeared in the journal American Studies. And finally, um, a book chapter entitled Aesthetics, which can be found in Key Terms in Material Religion, edited by Brent Plate. The title of Inken's presentation is Algorithms as Formations Analogous to Religion, Discourses and Materialities. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to, um, to also um, say to you, Inken, and to all that unfortunately uh, our director, Professor Marco Ventura, will not be able to join us today uh, because of other work commitments at university. Um, he's very sorry uh, and, uh, and he sends you, Inken, his best uh, regards. Now, without further ado, um, I will give the floor to Inken. Um, as usual, we will have 25 minutes for Inken's presentation, and we'll then keep ourselves 25 minutes for the discussion. Inken, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, oh, you reminded me 25 minutes. I might talk a little bit longer. I apologize for that. Um, and I'm going to talk about algorithms as formations analogous to religion, as you already mentioned. But before I start, let me thank uh, the team over there in Italy, at the other side of the mountains, for setting uh, this whole thing up. I'm very glad to be here today. Whenever I tell people that I'm doing research and teaching in the field of Zen Buddhism, they react in the same way. They tell me something along the lines of, oh, how wonderful and how interesting. You must tell me more about spiritual experiences and explain meditation to me. I never know what to say because these modern Western associations of Zen Buddhism with meditation and um, extraordinary experiences have very little to do with Buddhism as a lived religion. Buddhist lived Religion has to do with this world, the benefits, taking care of the dead, or protection of the state and the social order. There's a considerable gap between Buddhism's social realities on the one hand and the ascriptions, associations, and, well, one could say, the fantasies of Buddhism on the other hand. We can observe a likewise gap when it comes to AI. 
Most of the debates and public dis discussions about artificial intelligence focus on fictional and hypothetical AI. Science fiction, Hollywood and the tech dreams of mostly white men fuel our AI imaginations. These fantasies include killer robots who strive for annihilation of the human race, uploads of human consciousness into the cloud, freezing cadavers, and pizza delivery with drones. We need to distinguish this imagery from the current social realities of AI. As Boris pointed out in his introductory remarks to this webinar series a few weeks ago, it is essential to differentiate between the field of currently applied AI, mostly summarized under narrow AI, and the field of imagined AI that has that is also known as general AI. And in my talk, I would like to int introduce you to the world of AI as a lived religion. In order to do so, I'm going to start with discourses of AI as theology. Then I'm going to talk about the materialities of AI religion. I'm going to elaborate on the practices of algorithmic derived religion I'm going to briefly talk about the religious side effects, particularly the side effect of exclusion, and then I will hopefully reach my conclusion in time. My talk is informed by theories of religious studies combined with ethnography and digital ethnography. As many of you might know, religious studies people are obsessed with the category of religion and I'm afraid that I'm not an exception. My talk will therefore suggest the definition of, rel of religion. However, let me stress that I do not intend to prove that the reliance on AI or the dependence on algorithms constitute a religion. I would like to stress, although I said that I'm a little bit obsessed too, that we are the masters of our categories. Categories are tools for us. I do not care if something is religious or not. I do care about applying the findings of religious studies on formations that show analogies to religions. As I will hopefully be able to argue, this theoretical frame opens new insights into these formations a kind to what we call religions. The imagined realities that humans invent are the subject of religious studies. Fictitious stories exert tremendous forces in the world. In the ascriptions towards Zen Buddhism, the discourses of meditation and spiritual experiences, um, they are very important because they constitute the foundations of identity, legitimacy and marketing. The imagined fields of general AI fulfill correlated functions. These imagination, imaginations generate the foundations for the shared identity, values, and goals of contemporary society's attitudes towards technology. However, let's pause for a moment. This shared function alone, alone does not make AI a religion. Let's briefly clarify the notion of religion. Relying on reflections on the term by David Morgan, David Schiedester, Martin Riesebrot and others, I would like to suggest religion has come to be widely understood as embodied practices and discourses that cultivate relations between people and non-human forces like gods, superhuman agencies or transcendent laws or claims. With these practices and discourses, humans strive for salvation, constitute communities and create side effects among them boundaries to exclude others. So as keywords, we find discourses and practices, non-human forces, salvation, and the side effects. Research on the discourses of AI show their general characteristics. The firm belief in technological progress based on AI process data as the only possible and inevitable path to salvation for humankind. A feature of AI discourses that Yuval Harari calls dataism. The conviction that the application of computation can solve any problem. A belief that James Bridle is calling solutionism 
or computational thinking. This computational thinking makes it impossible to think of the world in terms that are not computable. Excluded is everything that cannot be expressed in terms of processable data. The abundant research literature on AI discourse discloses many more features that entail assumptions that cannot be said to be immanent to itself alone, alone and therefore rest on transcendent claims. These transcendent claims are particularly evident in the discourse on transhumanism that will be discussed in this webinar later this year on here, so I'm not going to elaborate on this today. Returning to the attributes of religion, we can ascertain that AI's discourses refer to transcendent claims and purport an exclusive path to salvation. The discourses constitute the foundation for creating a sacred zone of inclusion those who believe in the sociological power of data and exclusion, the world and people beyond tech and data. Based on these shared attributes of religion and AI, I suggest understanding tech euphoric discourse, the politics of governments relying on these discourses and the marketing messages of the big tech companies as the religious doctrine or the theology of artificial intelligence. There's more to religion or theology. We also have to consider how these fictitious notions are disseminated, how they gain currency, how they convince people. The question arises, how does the AI doctrine accomplish that task? For explaining that, we have to consider the dynamics of mediatization and the practice the practices and materialities of religion. Relying on the theories of material religion, I want to argue that the powers of materialities transform AI doctrines into religions. Material religions approaches to the study of religion analyze how otherwise inaccessible, allegedly transcendent agents, concepts or ideas are rendered accessible via verbal and non-verbal carriers of subsumed under the term sensational forms. A material religion approach helps us to understand how religions activate the body and the senses, initiate transform transformation processes and bind actors to their respective causes. Due to the massive, massive uh, mediation processes, these sensational forms can reach us day and night through television, our computers and our phones. Theories of meditation argue that mass media shape and frame our communication, becoming increasingly important sources of information and identity, orientation and value. These communications operate by addressing both cognition and our senses. So we have to return to material religion again. This is what you get when you search for images of AI at DuckDuckGo. As we can see, the color blue dominates the visual presentation of AI. We see galaxies, skyscrapers, abstract shapes and variations of Michelangelo's painting of Adam's creation. This AI creation meme, meme as Beth, you find it here in the middle, as Beth Zingler is calling the variation, can be found very often on the internet, accompanying media reports, government publications, and web pages of research institutions when it comes to the topic. And and I'm very angry for, for interrupting, but I'm still seeing the slide on media, mediatization and material religion. Is that the one you're also have in front of you? No, I have the other one in front of me, and let's wait for... <laughs> A second. Uh, give me a sign when you see it. Sure. Um, so, as these examples illustrate, specific designs and materialities inform our understanding of AI. Research and marketing reveals that colors play an essential role in our perception and evaluation. The color of royal blue is often used to denote seriousness and trustworthiness. It is associated with safety, authority, and functionality. The popular imaginary of blue brains and neuroscience relies on these associations, as my colleague Alexandra 
Grisa has argued. So you still don't see the picture. Yes, it's it's an algorithmic problem. It's probably the fight of Microsoft, uh, Google against Apple because I'm using an Apple. I'm sorry. I hope uh, the, the problem will be solved soon, but I'm going to continue to the next slide. Perhaps you see that. No, I'm still seeing the other one, but don't worry. Oh, actually, yes, now I'm seeing, um, yes, now I can see the, the image of FBK ICT. Now you see the ICT picture. Yes. Good. So please, all of you, just Google, just Google, a, just type in AI and uh, click on images, and then you see all these blue pictures. And um, you will see a similarity here because now I'm at the homepage uh, of your institution um because uh, the the ict is using the blue too and as you probably have uh, noticed i'm using it too i used to um use uh, the color of pink for my presentation but then i realized that there are people who do not take me seriously so i switched to blue too um i'm showing the next slide here's another very effective aesthetic presentation of ai uh, Margarita, just let me know if you see it too. All right, let's wait. Let's hope for the best. The show Devs 2019 on HBO by Alex Garland. Probably some of you saw it. Um, this show features a high-tech company. The supercomputer at the heart of Devs is floating in a shimmering gold box. The computer itself is bathed in bright light, looking precious, unreachable, and superior. Of course, one could, one could name tons of other examples of how Hollywood is deepening our belief in AI by targeting our senses, evoking effective attitudes like awe, fascination, and looking for something beyond our ordinary lives. And here's another example um, of how the affirmative discourse on tech is binding us through our senses. I'm talking now about the Futurium. Um, you cannot see the Futurium. Which slide do you see? Still FBK ICT. Uh, uh, Dimitri says in yes, I see it. I see it. Um, try to click back and forth. Let's see if that works. All right, now, Futur yes, now we can see Futurim in Berlin. Okay, I'm so I'm always clicking a little bit, but then I need more time. The Futurium opened in 2019 as a house of the future. The new building is prominently situated at the River Spree and borders the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, which initiated it. The building is extraordinary in shape and color. The building's envelope, wall, ceiling, and the other parts um, consists of a uniform net-like net structure. Here, um, at least on my picture, you see this net-like structure. The ceiling and the exhibition hall wall on the first floor that present AI have been clad with metal grid panels and a linear arrangement of fluorescent LED tubes. As a result, even if you don't see the picture, you have to believe me, being in the exhibition hall evokes a feeling of being in a computer. And needless to say, I'm showing my next slide, but I'm clicking a little bit. Uh, needless to say, to say that Pepper, one of the many variations of the cute, um, of a cute Japanese uh, robot, is greeting the visitors upon entering the hall. The section on technology covers robots, AI, and human enhancement. Headlines read, working between the worlds, always on duty, creating new beings, in def infinite provision, and blending realities, and so on. I guess the general tenor of the messages become crystal clear. The Futurium presents technology in a thoroughly optimistic, positive, almost euphoric manner. As you might have seen in the pictures, the Futurium pre presents the messages and artifacts in an aseptic, minimalistic, refined way. Dominating colors are white and light green. According to marketing experts, green makes you think of world is associated with freshness, peace, rest and security, a feeling of abundance and environmental initiatives. 
The design of the exposition framed technology within associations of rationality, objectivity and progress and further implies that science and progress go together. The curators of the Futurium assert that it is a free space for thinking about the future. However, knowledge is intrinsically related to aesthetic forms that shape our attitudes, emotions and actions. The composition of cognitive messages and sensuous impacts with this composition, the Futurium strengthen affirmative attitudes towards technology, perhaps even the conviction that our technological future is inevitable and the only way to ensure our future. Now, nothing wrong with being optimistic about the future, one could argue. That is true, but the problem is the contradiction of what the Futurium wants to be, a space for open discussion about tech, and what it turns out to be, a sin for me of affirmation towards technology. The blue pictures presenting AI on the internet, the homepage designs of tech research institutes, or the covers of books on AI, or machine learning, or effective computing, constitute sensational forms similar to that of religions. With their conflation of cognitive and sensuous messages, they bind people to the statements of AI theology. As one of the many consequences of tech belief, we welcome the sleek design of our phones, tablets and computers into our homes, bags and baths. Close to our bodies, we permit tech to exert its Im immersive powers over us. The concurrence of discourses and materialities transform AI into something that becomes unquestionable and self-evident. AI becomes naturalized. It becomes a phenomenon analogous to religions. So let's turn to practices. Religions are widely understood as practices of salvation. On the level of lived religion, this translates into problem solving in this world and dealing with the terror of death and taking care of our imaginations of what happens to our ancestors and us after death, as uh, the aforementioned Zen Buddhism does also. AI pr practices offer similar services. Increasingly, algorithms um, are not only applied for decision making, but also become relevant for solving problems um, of, uh, and questions of morality and justice. Humans trust algorithms because they are supposed to be rational and objective. However, as Ali Rahimi, a leading researcher at Google, is saying, among other people, machine, learn machine learning has become alchemy or alchemy. He argued that many of today's machine learning models are poorly understood and under theorized. The workings of today's algorithms are too complex for a single person to understand. The workings of AI applications and more and more characterized by indescribability and technological opacity. In his first talk, Jakob pointed out to the totalization of immersion through AI technologies. Augmented reality technologies can produce experiences of transcendence. They put into practice century old and contemporary imaginations about spiritual experiences. They are, among others, able to produce a perfect Zen meditation experience, challenging thereby traditional religions and our conceptions of authenticity. The consequences of augmented reality application become particularly evident when it comes to dealing with death. Temples in Japan and new companies all over the world offer augmented reality-based digital resurrection of the deceased. Algorithms are reading patterns out of vast set of data to reproduce, to reproduce the dead digitally. And you still cannot see it. We, we are on the slide of algorithmic practices. Great. So you see um, on the right, you see the birthday present that Kane West gave to Kim Kardashian in October of this year. He gave her um, a digital resurrection of her dead father. And on YouTube, you can see the video of the title, um, Surprise from Heaven, how uh, Kim Kardashian's father is uh, talking to her, uh, to Kim. 
Transhumanists aim at transcending the body through cryonics, conservation through freezing. The transhumanist fantasies about transgressing the boundaries between this world and the world beyond materialize through technology. Cryonics can be understood as technological manifestations of the Buddhist practice of mummification. So starving oneself to death, becoming a, body, uh, becoming a Buddha in this body, realizing enlightenment in this world. And I would like to uh, uh, elaborate more on this topic, but uh, let me uh, also mention, lastly, that religions are always changing. Transformation is also continuously occurring in AI religion. People turn progressively to Google with questions about God, spirituality, death and life after death. Algorithms navigate the answers and at the same time creating new algorithms that control the search engines and the answers. In doing so, Google is generating new religions, ideas and notions all the time. Besides discourses, practices, materialities and transcendent claims, my heuristic definition of religion includes religious side effects. As do religions, AI entail a wide range of side effects creating identities, feelings of belonging, foundations of cooperation, and so on. But they also create unwanted side effects. Trust and reliance on algorithms entail the loss of control, responsibility, and independence. Humans are delegating their fate more and more to algorithms instead of God or the gods or goddesses. And then the question um, comes up, uh, who is um, responsible for what happens? However, I consider the religious powers of exclusion even more severe. What does AI believe, uh, what does AI believe leave out of sight is the question. The belief in AI disguises the many problems of AI-based technology. We already talked about them. Um, algorithmic discrimination, increasing surveillance and loss of privacy and ever increasing uneven creation of wealth resulting in data monarchies or new net states, as Alexis Wykowski put it, and the tons of other problems critics point out to. I would like to concentrate on the power of boundary drawing by AI religions. Men dominate the world of tech. According to studies, only 20% of people working in tech are women. As a result, the STEM field culture is heavily influenced by white male bias and genius myth. The bias constitutes the source for widespread gender discriminations in AI devices, for example, face and voice recognition, data analysis and health and well-being, the development of medicine, and many more applications. And of course, this does not only account for gender, but also for race. However, gender discrimination is not the only, and I would like to argue, not the biggest problem. Engineering and coding impose masculinized norms and expectations on AI developments that limit approaches to scientific research. Building rockets that fly to Mars or AI driven weapons and all the other applications I mentioned. How are algorithms supposed to help us in our ordinary life? As one example, I would like to present Brian Christian and Tom uh, Griffin's book algorithms to live by the computer science of everyday life decision. As the promotion text reads in this dazzling interdisciplinary work, acclaimed authors, Christian and cognitive scientist Griffith, show us how the simple, precise algorithms used by computers can also untangle very human questions. A look into the book reveals what kind of problems we are dealing with. The search for secretaries, parking spaces, romantic partners, restaurants, and the planning of the day. Starting with the fact that the authors only look for women in their search for secretaries and th therefore the whole thing is a misnomer anyway, the book deals with typical male problems and offers solutions for them. This attitude mirrors the androcentric world of tech. AI discourse draws boundaries around a limited part of the enormous field of human life and experiences. Ever heard of childcare, cultivating the complex network of family and friends, getting ready for Christmas, 
or conquering the morning chaos with children in the realm of AI and machine learning? Meredith Broussard coined the term techno-chauvinism for this narrow view of AI technology. To conclude, as we have seen with AI, we are dealing with a formation analogous to religion. As a formation a kind to religion, AI disguises another, even bigger technological disruption that was already mentioned last week by Lionel Obadia. That is to say, algorithmic magic or digital animism. Digital animism refers to a new algorithmic magical universe that is, that is in the making in our contemporary world. Digital animism consists of two emerging digital developments. Firstly, algorithms are operating more and more on the foundation of growing openness, as I already mentioned. They rely on automated recursion processes. That is to say, the models and rules they detect are applied to themselves again. Their workings and outcomes become increasingly independent of their creators, hence turning into entities, um, turning into entities with self-sufficient volition. These digital entities evoke associations with spirits supposedly operating in animism. The second digital development that evokes ideas of animism is the IoT the Internet of Things. The number of IoT-enabled devices is continually growing. Current estimates differ between 25 and 30 billion Internet-enabled devices that are surrounding us. And if the slide is there, please count the number, the, um, the number of zeros there. That comes down to two to three devices for every human on Earth. These devices are progressively able to communicate with each other. With their sensors, they are turning into sentient beings. Like algorithms, they transform into entities independent from their human creators by simultaneously gaining increasingly influence over our lives like the spirits in animism. What scholars describe as digital animism or digital magic constitutes a new, this worldly religion. Algorithms and the IoT bring about superhuman agents produced by humans. Therefore, we should reevaluate narrations about killer robots a la Hollywood as what they are from the perspective of religious studies. They constitute parts of the religious distraction strategy of AI. We are currently producing more and more superhuman entities in this world, which are progressively taking over control. Here, as I would like to argue finally, we find the apocalyptic dynamic of AI that we need to take seriously. Thank you very much, Inken, for this very clear uh, presentation, very fascinating, and I must say, in some respects, also frightening. <laughs> um, so I would now like to, to open the floor for the discussion. Um, for anyone who would like to make a question or, or a comment, just write so in the chat. Uh, here we have the first question from uh, Robert Geraci. Please, the floor is yours. Sorry, I didn't have the mic on right away. <clears throat> Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Again, that was really, really insightful. Um, I have like a couple of things and I don't, I don't know. So um, two were just things I would love to have you elaborate on. Um, one, the Museum Futurium and its approach to human enhancement. Um, I particularly loved your engagement with aesthetics of futurism and design decisions. And I wonder if you've conducted any field work with the, with the curators or other design folks to look for kind of the 
intentionality in the relationship between things like color or affirmation or human futures, or how much of that is just already built into the way we behave. Um, and, and so those are the things I was hoping you might elaborate on. And then, and you can just ignore anything you don't want to. Uh, and then the one question is at the back end when you were talking about animism, I wonder if it might be clearer to see that through the lens of Marx's sense of the fetish, where we grant life to the non-living and simultaneously mechanize ourselves as servants of the fetish, right? So to what extent is the Internet of Things more like a fetish where we dumb ourselves down and become servants to the things which we've now granted all kinds of life that they don't have? Um, thank you very much for that wonderful questions and thank you very much that we finally are talking to each other and I'm so disappointed that we will not have an AI section at the AAR this year and so on. Um, the Futurium, I had to postpone. My, I did, I visited in March and I wanted to come back in April and then I couldn't because of Corona. And uh, But now, thank you very much because I'm just going to write them an email and ask if I can conduct an interview. Um, yes, but I didn't get around to do this. So, um, but there's a lot of written material on the aims uh, and on the design and the museum also when a prize for architecture and um, it's really, it's completely euphoric and it's also, it is supposed to be completely neutral and all what is written about it. But I'm going to conduct interviews. Thank you. Um, and uh, when it comes to animism, yes. Um, my the whole talk my whole talk started with the Marx Marxist Marxist critique of religion, and I would say that uh, the fetish is a very good word for seeing the continuity between consumerism, well alienation, consumerism, and now the IoT. Uh, but of course, one would have to elaborate further on that. But I will do that. Thank you, and thank you again for a great talk. Thank you, Robert, for your question and Inken for your uh, for your answer. Um, if anyone else would like to make a comment or a question, just write so in the chat, and then I will give you the floor. Um, if if no one else would like to go for now, I might. I, I will actually. Um, I will go ahead. Uh, I'm going to to raise a similar question and comment to the one that I've already uh, raised in a previous webinar when uh, Beth Singler was here because um, I think this issue keeps coming back. At least it comes back to my attention. And um, so we have been grappling with the issue of how to deal with religion for centuries. Okay, uh, so both as society and as individuals. So um, what I mean by that is that we've been we've been thinking about how much to rely on religion in our daily lives, how much to rely on, on, on religions for, for our decisions. Um, and then from the state perspective, what sort of relationship and separation there should be between religion and politics, okay? Now, it seems that if AI is becoming the new religion in a way, uh, which also seems to be in a way also promoted by the state, right? we should ask ourselves similar questions with regard to the right relationship to have between the state, politics, and AI, and between ourselves, right, and AI tools. So my question for you is this one. Do you think, and if you think that's the case, what sort of, let's say, good practices we might want to adopt um, from the ones that we have been developing with regards to religions, which ones we want to adopt maybe, and what could be useful for us to to let's say inherit from that dimension with this new issue, with this new emerging religion of AI. I hope I made myself clear enough. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for the question. Well, at, at first um, we, we cannot leave the floor to the coders and the tech people, but we, we need to have a, uh, um, cultural studies people, religious studies people like us, and we really have to raise our voices. And um, in the moment, um, um, many, um, many uh, committees and associations and um, evaluators, um, there are many theologians participating. And as much as, and philosophers, well, let's stick to theologians. And as much as, as I appreciate that, I think that critical cultural studies needs to be more involved. 
Secondly, I would like to recommend the book I already I also mentioned by Alexis Wykowski, um, who um, is writing about net states. She is writing that uh, companies like Google and uh, Tesla and uh, Apple are uh, becoming much more powerful than the actual national states. They're becoming net states. And um, um, actually, uh, Denmark, have, realizing that, is the first country who has um, its uh, a digital uh, and internet ambassador. So somebody who is talking on behalf of the nation of Denmark with the with the internet and and with the net states and i think uh, we uh, all the countries in the world or at least uh, countries in the european union and other countries they have to establish uh, not only ministries but they have to establish um, um, uh, such ambassadors who take care of our rights as citizen users users of the internet um, in dealing with the internet um, in order to protect us, but also in order to, yeah, to, to find strategies of distancing ourselves again and again um, from this, this, this super immersive impact of uh, the digital world, of AI, uh, and of machine learning algorithms, which are growing all the time. Thank you, Inc. And yes, I believe that the, cre the development of new ministries on uh, uh, on uh, working on on the internet and how to to protect us from the side the bad side effects of the internet is de necess definitely necessary and um, and let, let's hope there will be more development in this direction in the future um now we'd like to give the floor to boris um yes can you hear me yes great thank you very much Inken. um uh, we have talked about all these things a lot over the past uh, weeks and months. So, um, but I would like to. Uh, I have one comment and one um, question. The, the comment regards what you said towards the beginning of your presentation, when you said you're not really interested in, in uh, uh, answering the question of whether or not AI is a religion or whether or not transhumanism is a religion, but you're more interested in the question. And that's that was for me kind of an eye opener at some point in our discussions. Uh, you're more interested in the, to the question of whether we can um, fruitfully apply uh, conceptual tools and theories developed in religious studies uh, in un trying to understand what's going on with artificial intelligence. So um, I think th this is a, this is an important uh, important shift. I mean, there, there's a big difference between the question is X and a religion, a religion, and the question um, can we usefully can we fruitfully apply religious studies categories, uh, theories, uh, in trying to understand X? So, so that, that was my comment. That's great. Um, regarding the, um, it's still in a slightly methodological vein. I mean, um, you said, so you're more interested in, um, in the second question. My impression is, um, oh no, here's my question to you. Do you think that religious studies scholars are have some kind of particularly um, useful way of looking at artificial intelligence uh, technologies and their, their interpretations in, in narratives and so on? Or is this just one contribution in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, yeah, in a group, let's say? Because, I mean, I, I was thinking about many of the things that you talked about could be uh, addressed also by what in German, the German-speaking world is known as uh, Ideologiekritik, for instance, which is not necessarily religious studies, uh, close to religious studies. It could also be approached by political sciences. It could be, and so on, and so on. So my question is, is there anything specific about, relig of the, about the perspective of religious studies scholars that enables them to have a, a, a particularly interesting view on this topic? That's a difficult question, Boris. Um, I'm very ambivalent about the answer. Um, I think that all disciplinary 
glorification is not good for us because it creates new boundaries. So I don't want to say, yes, religious studies is super for this. Um, but then I think it is super uh, for, for, for answering the questions, um, particularly because of two reasons. Ideologies, well, they have. Ideologies also have a practice. There's also There are also dealings with death and communism and um, dealing with, uh, with wheat to passage uh, in consumerism, right. But um, what religious scholars are doing, um, if they do their job, is looking into the lived religion and look into all these practices and look how the doctrine is turning into something we embody and we live in our ordinary lives. And here, I think, a close um, cooperation between uh, anthropology and uh, religious studies is very good, very helpful for explaining to us um, how AI is living in, in our lives and it, how, it take, how it takes over our lives. That's the one thing, and related to that, um, Although we had the material turn, I think, in political studies and particularly in sociology, because it's basically Wissen, still Wissens sociology, or I don't know, it has something to do with uh, some gender thing, I, I also think. But anyway, um, uh, looking into the materialities of things, this is something what uh, religious studies in the form of material religion, embodiment, um, is doing um, since the last decades and as I try as I try to show today um, it's necessary that we not only talk about the concepts and the ideas of some people who publish a book who m maybe five people read but how these concepts are coming into our ordinary lives and, uh, and in, uh, attacking our senses and, um, and uh, so I think that uh, religious studies Mm, scholar, religious studies scholars in cooperation with general cultural studies and um, anthropologists are particularly have a, have a particularly good expertise to deal with AI and the consequences for humankind. Yay! Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Um, if I may, I, I would also like to to add another another question. Um, so I was thinking, is the creation of this new AI religion the same all over the world and in all cultures and societies, uh, to your knowledge, or are there differences? So are the same cognitive and sensory factors or elements, are these the same um, in all places, or are there cultural differences, or you know, differences depending on the on the on the country that we are that we are looking at? Well, um, of course, there's a digital divide. Um, the AI applications are particularly uh, we find them in this in the highly industrialized societies, um, and. Um, I would argue that uh, the dissemination of AI religion does not depend on culture, but on wealth. So the wealthier the country, the more developed is the AI religion, which is, oh, that's a drag, isn't it? But oh, well, I rephrase. Um, th th that's a very bizarre conclusion. Um, but we can see that when it comes to the ownership of cell phones, uh, even, if, uh, even in, 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 in countries uh, with a very low income, um, there is access to the internet and uh, um, the, av the av availability of um, cell phones is very widespread. I would argue that um, the dissemination of AI religion does not have anything to do with culture. Um, I see very similar developments in Japan and um, in China. And um, I cannot find uh, any reasons uh, for, uh, I, I cannot observe any, observe, um, any, any, any um, differences. Well, there are differences, but uh, they are not coming out of culture, they come out of politics. For example, in Japan, there's a huge, um, there's a huge, um, there's a huge impact 
of the government uh, in developing AI. And there, there's a huge support for ro robot, ro robotics. And there's the, the government created an, uh, a robocentric ideology. Um, but this is not com this is not coming out of the culture. Um, and I hope that in the future, um, I mean, um, Robert, um, Robert is here. He contributed a, 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 very, a, hu a huge amount of work on uh, an insight into actually what I would call the religious history of AI. So the religious sources, roots, and con continuities we, we find in AI. But um, I, um, but they are coming out of Christianity. They are coming out of counterculture. They come out of Buddhism. But what we also know that is in the 19th century, we see the globalization uh, and also the homogenization of religious history. So I think in terms of culture and religion, we share a global religious history, which, which constitutes the basis for the current development of AI religion. Very interesting. Thank you, Inken. Um, we now have a question from Arka Prava Tatu Padiai. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, my question would be uh, that since uh, there are a lot of softwares that are available now which are based on uh, AI, that is adhering to uh, the uh, performance of the religious rituals that people uh, uh, would usually perform uh, in uh, when they meet each other physically, in, especially during these COVID times. Uh, so ma'am, uh, my question is, does the context in terms of the traditional narratives and uh, the uh, does the context of religion change? I'd like to take an example so that uh, I could make myself a little bit more clear. Uh, ma'am, I'm from India. And here uh, we have a Hindu ritual uh, called the Durga Puja. And uh, it is actually attended by millions of people. But during the COVID uh, pandemic times, when uh, there is a lot of government uh, norms and uh, judicial directives against gathering in places, when we see that there have been a lot of uh, uh, applications, augmented reality based uh, applications that are doing the rounds on uh, mediums such as Facebook and uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter as well. So there is there are a lot of these hashtags which are uh, uh, which are actually becoming very popular. Uh, but ma'am, if we were to look at the traditional way these rituals were performed, uh, it is absolutely uh, something that has changed or transcended the realm where the ritual used to be performed. But yet, ma'am, uh, whilst doing a sentiment analysis of uh, the comments and of, of the religious fulfillment of the people, uh, I could see that ma'am, it, it was actually very effective uh, and it was actually, it has really contributed to upholding the uh, social distancing norms amidst a very festival uh, time here in India. So ma'am, uh, I think that AI has really contributed in terms of lived religion, but then on the traditional narrative and uh, the tra definition of traditional religion itself. Uh, as Heidi Campbell would perhaps mention. Uh, Ma'am, don't you think that the context has changed? Is it religion or would you call it something uh, like banal religion or numinous perhaps? Numinous? Ah, oh, you like the Akra Prava. You like the, you like the talking about the numinosa of our Rudolf Otto's concept um, of the holy. Yes. Thank you very much for the question because it allows me to elaborate that when talking about AI and religion, we have two huge fields. We have AI and religion and AI as religion. And I talk today about AI as religion. Of course, and I think during this webinar, we are going, for example, last, next week, my, uh, no, the week after next week, my colleague Erika Barfelli is going to talk about a uh, minder, I guess, um, a Japanese robot who is who is a cyber clergy who is performing uh, rituals um, in Kyoto. So this is um, AI and religion. How AI transforms the religions we already have. Uh, and last term, uh, in the last uh, term at um, Heidelberg University, I conducted a seminar with my students, and we looked into. Um, all kinds of rituals uh, which are now not taking place in the temple but on the internet and uh, i can only 
um, uh, I couldn't be, uh, um, um, I, I, I'm also convinced, like you expressed, that um, for some people, uh, the what you said, religious fulfillment became more intensified because uh, the digital um, communicated religion um, is uh, can be very nice, although and deep and intense and everything, although we are not meeting people. So I would like to suggest. Uh, but you ask if the context changed. Yes, of course the context changed. What we see is in disembodiment of religion. And this is, well, if, if uh, I'm, I'm, we, are, we are going towards the end of the talk, so I'm go go going to, to mention a personal opinion. This is frightening me, uh, this disembodiment of religion, uh, because it works. It works in, in, in um, attacking just our brains. And uh, I think um, that the possibilities of manipulation and the whole problem of authenticity, um, well, I do not have a problem with authenticity, but um, because uh, the, the question of authenticity arises, uh, we are all becoming much easier to be to being manipulated, as, as we saw the last last week and as we see with QAnon and with, uh, with all kinds of uh, current developments. So, yes, the context changed. Religions are also transforming through AI. And religions also always have, coming back to Marx, Marx um, 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 according to, uh, to Karl Marx, um, he's talking about the critique of religion. I don't know if this translates into English, but you can say, uh, the religion, uh, the critics towards religion and the critics of religion. So religions are always, of course, also a source for uh, critics, the, for criticizing the society. But um, I see that the disembodiment tendencies are actually weakening uh, the potentials of religion to criticize current developments in society. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Inken, for this very elaborate um, answer. And thank you, Arka Prava, for, for raising your, your question. Um, we still have a couple of minutes for um, any final comment or, or remark or brief question. So I'm going to give some, some moments to, to any of you who would like to, to make a comment. But um, yes. Martin, yes. Okay, Martin, yeah. yours. Hello. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, it was very interesting. Um, my question kind of jumps back to the uh, not the last answer you gave, but the answer before that, um, because um, in terms of um, attitudes to digital privacy, I think we can see a difference um, globally. For example, in countries like China or Seoul, we saw that during the um, first um, lockdown period of the coronavirus that people were more willing to share that information. Um, and my question would be, um, do you believe that this is also culturally influenced and what uh, influence does these differences have in AI as a religion? Um, you mean the reactions during the first corona lockdown in China? Um, no, I, I just wanted to say that as an example, but more generally, um, how differences in attitudes to digital privacy um, influence how AI um, develops as a, um, as a phenomenon analogous to religion. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for getting back to that question. Um, as I already explained, to the internet, um, but also due to media before that, like printing, television, all these mass media, I would be very hesitant to talk about cultural differences, um, but rather talk about political uh, differences and differences in the distribution of wealth. So 
Uh, I cannot answer the question uh, about China because there are too many people knowing much more about China than I do in the audience. But when it comes to Japan, I only can return to my assertion that I think we have to look into, as we do as scholars of religion, we have to look into the political and social context of the applications of AI and not so much into the cultural contexts to understand the, the affirmation, the, the emergence of AI religion, but also the relationship, be, uh, but also the way how um, AI is transforming existing religions. Thank you, Marlies, for your, you. for your question. I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? No, no, I was just um, thanking. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're running out of time. So thank you, everyone, for engaging in this discussion and for participating to today's webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Inken, for your presentation. Um, now, Boris, back to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much also from my side, Inken, and thank you to uh, everyone who just listened or participated in the discussion and followed this um, this webinar. Um, let me just remind you, I just put it into the into the chat. Uh, again, there's a, a website of the webinar series. So if you want to check out forthcoming talks, speaker bios, but also recordings of past episodes, um, have a look at that website. Um, Inken already mentioned that uh, uh, in two weeks time, um, uh, Erika Baffelli will be our next speaker on uh, Wednesday, November the 25th of November, with a talk entitled The Android and the Facts. Um, thank you very much again from my side and uh, hope to see you again soon in our next or one of our next uh, webinar episodes. Thanks a lot and bye bye.